The Falklands became an armed camp. In their thousands, young conscripts arrived from Argentina. La primera vez que ingresé al al pueblo, veía que todo lo que había, todo lo que había. The first time I went into Port Stanley, I noticed that everything was English. There was practically nothing there to remind me of Argentina. I remember picking up a little nail and it had uh, Made in England uh, written on it. So I started wondering what it all meant. I thought, where am I? What is this? I had been told that we were going to the Malvinas to defend our people. But it turned out that they weren't our people at all. So you had to ask yourself, who were the invaders? Them or us? Malvinas Operation Theatre Command, communique number four, guarantees the continuity of the way of life of the people of the islands, respect for private property, freedom to enter, leave or remain on the islands. Furthermore, the population is exhorted to continue normally with their activities. One of the first things they said when they arrived, that nothing would change. And the next thing they said was how things had to change. We had to drive on the other side of the road. We had to have passes to go around Stanley. We weren't allowed out of Stanley. And people, of course, thought back to the, uh, the Second World War and how it must have felt for the French and the Dutch and the countries, you know, in Europe, occupied by the Germans. Acá están reunidos obreros empresarios, intelectuales, todos los órdenes de la vida nacional, en la unión nacional, en procura del bienestar del país y su dignidad. Que sepa el mundo, América, que un pueblo con voluntad, pueblo argentino, Si quieren venir, que vengan, les presentaremos batalla. The government turned to the armed forces. I think everybody thought it would all be over before we got there. You know, there'd be a few little troops on a little island, and when they seen the, the Royal Navy coming, they'd scurry home. You know, it would be all over.
dar altímetro eh, graduado a 30 pies. I set my altimeter at 30 feet, but I must have gone lower than that because the alarm went off several times. We were flying at 450 knots and at that sort of height, well, it's quite a peculiar experience. I saw the masts of the frigate up ahead and we lined up for the attack. El buque estaba reaccionando bien. El buque había incrementado su velocidad al máximo. The ship was reacting well. I could see that it was moving at top speed, making for the open waters in the middle of the channel, trying to maneuver away from us. By this time, the ship was directly below me. So I banked over her, dropped the bombs and escaped. I certainly felt that the skipper below me knew what he was doing. As I flew away, I heard my wingman say, well done, sir, which meant that at least one of my bombs had hit target. De mi numeral, que decía, muy bien, señor, eso me indicaba que de mis bombas algo habían dado bien. Argentina was not defenseless against the task force. It too had a powerful navy which set out to find the British fleet and sink it. There were new warships equipped with modern missiles. But proudest of all was the World War II cruiser USS Phoenix, now renamed after one of Argentina's greatest heroes, General Belgrano. Serving on the Belgrano was the goal of every professional sailor because of her tradition and because of what she represented in the Argentine Navy. The nuclear submarine HMS Conqueror had been patrolling the South Atlantic for a fortnight. It shadowed the Belgrano for two days. And the ship right ahead on that bearing. 294. At 4 p.m. on the 2nd of May, under direct orders from London, it fired three torpedoes at the cruiser. Two struck home. Esa primera explosión fue realmente la que causó la mayor cantidad de muertos en el buque. The first explosion was the cause of the greatest number of deaths on the Belgrano. About 275 sailors died as a result of that explosion and the massive flooding that followed. Four seconds later came the second torpedo, 15 feet from the bow. Those 15 feet practically disappeared underwater. All the crew members assembled by their life rafts, waiting for the order to abandon ship. I finally decided to give that order, and surely it must be the most painful and tragic order in a naval officer's career. We knew there were more people below decks and there was nothing we could do to rescue them. We could have tried, but it was just impossible. All we could do was try and collect the wounded from the main deck and take them to the life rafts. Most of them had been burned by the explosions and the fires. We knew that we were leaving behind lots of our friends. They were below decks, hoping that we could somehow rescue them. We just couldn't get to them. I couldn't bear it, leaving them behind. And there was nothing you could do? No. Driven by strong winds towards the Antarctic Ocean, the life rafts from the Belgrano drifted in sub-zero temperatures. 
After two days, some were recovered by the hospital ship Bahia Paraiso. Many of the Belgrano sailors had died of exposure. They had literally frozen to death. Lieutenant Colonel Jones, Captain Wood, Captain Dane, Lieutenant Barry, The distance from St. Carlos to Stanley is 60 miles. British troops had to walk the whole way. This yomp was carried out in extremely harsh conditions, freezing temperatures, snow, and driving rain. Fresh water you couldn't get, so obviously, you know, you take what you can, you know, out of the ground, and um, we would sort of stamp onto the peat or dig holes until we got a puddle because it was always sod on the ground. Um, scoot the water in a mug and put some sterilising tablets in. Now, this water was absolutely black, but, I mean, you drank it. I mean, the, the doc, he just said, you know, the only thing you can do, because you're losing body fluid, is to just drink lots of water. Of course, we're drinking that crap again. As the British troops closed in, the Argentine conscripts could only wait. Dug in on the mountains around Stanley, they prepared for the final battles. And uh, after a while, you know, people, you could almost feel almost a sense of relief. People were beginning to think, well, they've, they've bugged out, they're not here anymore. And just as we were beginning to feel that, um, there was suddenly, literally, the, the horizon just lit up in a complete sort of sea of white flashes. <laughs> That initial firefight was quite incredible. It was like being at the wrong end of a machine gun range. And the, the noise was incredible. And I think we were fairly stunned for, for a minute or two. And you, you really had the feeling that if you raised your hand, you know, slightly in the air, it would be shot off. Terminé de cargar y me levanté. Y cuando me levanté, I finished loading, and when I stood up, there was a British soldier right in front of me. By this time, they were all over us, and then he shot me. He shot me in the head. I felt as though I was falling backwards in, in slow motion. They must have thought I was dead. They just left me there. But in fact, the bullet hadn't hit the skull. It ran down my helmet and hit me in the back of the neck. And I thought, my God, I'm alive. 
as we started going up the mountain and the enemy were just melting before us, we just went faster and faster until we got to the top. And in a way, we almost couldn't believe that we'd got to the top. Um, and there, just four kilometers away or something, and clearly in view, was Stanley. Um, we could see the lights. And I think for a, for a second or two, we just sort of stood there looking at this with um, euphoria that, you know, we'd done it. And of course, that was fatal because um, at that moment, from 200 meters away, an Argentinian automatic weapon of some sort and several other weapons opened up on us. And in that initial sort of burst, which was almost a sort of ambush, really, three of us were hit. I suddenly felt something like enormous sort of hammer blows on my legs. And the tracer from the rounds was like sort of, you know, sort of scarlet rods all around me. And uh, I noticed that my, my right leg especially, both my legs, but especially my right leg, was very sort of um, stiff already. And there was a sort of brief burning sensation through, through the muscle on my right arm. Entonces, hay una, una toma de conciencia de que ya... We realized that it was pointless to carry on. We had no more cards to play. Reducida apenas a 10 o 12. Our artillery was down to about 10 or 12 guns. Apoyo aéreo directo. We had no air support. Los ingleses mantenían... The British were just off our shores shelling us. Para reforzar sus propios fuegos. Our men were exhausted. They had fought hard and had lost much of their equipment. If we'd carried on, we would have just have been wasting lives. That is the conclusion I reached. So then I discussed it with the high command before accepting the British offer of a ceasefire and the start of negotiations. Resolví aceptar el cese del fuego ofrecido por los ingleses y más tarde se produjeron las conversaciones correspondientes. We sailed in early that morning. Everywhere that you looked were small boats packed with people to cheer us in. And it was a, a brilliant feeling, really, because, you know, it, it did make it then seem worthwhile. Strangers would come up and say something stupid like, uh, did you kill anybody, you know? Uh, or they'd be slapping you on the back and buying your pints, and you'd go along with it a bit, yeah, I was down there and all that lot. But you never really tell them what it was like, you just tell them, well, basically what, as much as the British public do know. I don't think there are any best moments. The, the whole affair is one of tragedy. It's a, war is a messy, dirty, miserable business. And uh, 
We should never, ever allow ourselves to go to war. We, the British people, are proud of what has been done. Proud of these heroic pages in our island story. Proud to be here today to salute the task force. Proud to be British. ¿Y por qué tuvo lugar la guerra de las Malvinas? Bien sencillo. Porque Estados Unidos utilizaba el batallón 401, las fuerzas especiales en Argentina, para la guerra sucia contra Nicaragua y la guerra sucia en El Salvador. Y le prestaban tan brillantes y agradables servicios a Estados Unidos que se creyeron en la ocasión de ocupar las Malvinas. Esto no tiene nada que ver con el derecho de Argentina a las Malvinas, que hemos defendido siempre, toda la vida. Pero los militares argentinos creyeron que habían llegado la hora de cobrarles los servicios que les prestaban en Centroamérica a Estados Unidos para que lo apoyaran en aquella aventura militar. Fue una aventura. En definitiva, porque eso no es forma de hacer la guerra. Las guerras se hacen o no se hacen. Y se hacen, y si se hacen hay que llevarlas hasta las últimas consecuencias, si son guerras justas.